Okay, let's take a minute to look at develop as an overview. As a reminder, develop is the third of the five phases or five components of the ADDIE paradigm. So that's the one we're going to specifically focus upon today. So we've already done analyze and design and implement and evaluate are coming up. Again, we want to keep in mind that the whole purpose of the instructional design process is to close the gap or to address the performance discrepancy and training can only help on the third of the three causes listed below, lack of knowledge or skills. Um, if the portion of or the portions of the gap that are caused by a lack of motivation or limited resources or lack of resources um, those cannot be completed or those cannot be closed using training only um, the lack of knowledge and skill can be closed or, or addressed through the use of training so let's take a look here so the purpose of the development phase is to generate and validate the actual learning resources. So in the previous phase, in the design phase, we designed the initial components of the training. And now we're basically starting to put the meat on the bones, so to speak. When you look at the development phase, there are six main stages steps or stages in this and the deliverable at the end of this is a, a learn a set of learning resources um, those six stages are to generate your instructional strategies to select or develop your media uh, to develop guidelines for the student and for the teacher to conduct formative revisions and then to conduct a pilot test now for the purposes of this course we are just going to focus on the first five um, I'll talk a little bit at the end of this presentation about conducting a pilot test, but there won't be an individual episode on it. And obviously, particularly for the purposes of the um, practice activity, but also for the purposes of the team project that you do later in the semester, you will not be expected to actually conduct a pilot test of your specific resources. So let's look a little bit at these stages. The first one is generate instructional strategies. And what you want to do here is essentially you're designing the episodes or the lessons that you are actually going to deliver and an effective episode or an effective lesson should have a beginning a middle and an end by that I mean that you should be able to sequence the activities in such a way that if you want to think of it in terms of a, of a journey up and down a mountain um, you know when you start off things should be a little bit easier than when you're tackling sort of the meat of whatever it is you want to do during that episode or that um, lesson which would be the middle which would tend to be a little bit more difficult um, there has to be a definitive endpoint to the lesson as well when you look at how you can go about creating these episodes um, there are a lot of different frameworks that you can use and there are a slew of instructional strategies um, that you can focus upon, many of which are based upon theory, not all. Um, the one in which we try to use here in this course, at least the way in which the lessons have been set up, the individual episodes are based on, and for that matter the notes that accompany them, have been Gagne's Nine Events of Instruction. For those of you not familiar with Gagne's Nine Events of Instruction, here are the nine events, and when we get to the particular episode that deals with generating instructional strategies. Um, Dr. Branch will actually talk about these in a little bit more detail. The second step is to select or develop supporting media that's necessary. So what you're looking at here is you're essentially looking at what media resources need are needed to facilitate the instructor or the teacher covering that specific objective with the students. Um, so if you think about this in terms of, of how you would put this system together, um, there are a couple of things that you want to keep in mind. Um, as you're looking at it, you want to think, well, what characteristics do um, the media encompass? For example, 
this media that we're using here. It's a, it's a narrated PowerPoint. It's, it's a video-based lecture that has a visual aspect to it. Um, so there are some specific characteristics to this. You've got the visual component. You've got the audio component that will allow you to describe in greater detail the summary of items that are put on the slide. When you think about those characteristics, <clears throat> are those things that will enhance or reinforce the objectives and the tasks that you want to be included in your lesson or in your episode? Are these things that will assist the learners because they present material in a variety of different learning modalities so that it could address the individual needs or the individual styles of the learner. These are some of the things you want to keep in mind when you're looking at selecting or developing specific supporting media for your class. The next step is developing guides for the student. Um, guides for the student are essentially a way of providing some structure or a navigation tool. Um, think of them almost as an advanced organizer for the students so that it allows you to really focus in upon the specific instructional strategies you wish to use so that you can make sure that the learning experience that you give to the student is, is as good as possible. Um, the format of the specific artifact that you create, this guide that you have, um, is going to vary a, a fair amount. Um, you know, if you were doing something for a classroom delivery, it would be more common to see a physical print guide as opposed to if you were doing something, say, for an online format like we have here, um, it'd be much more common to find an electronic uh, format uh, or an electronic guide. And even the way in which it's presented, um, some instructional goals lend themselves, and for that matter, even some delivery systems lend themselves to a greater amount of text depending on what it is you want to accomplish with the instruction that may be a lot uh, there may be a lot more visuals involved but essentially again what you want to do with the student is to provide a way of organizing the information before they actually start the instruction um, so that the learner knows what it is they are going to be doing, what sequence in which they are going to be doing those activities so that they can prepare themselves as best they can. A syllabus is a good example of a guide for students. Our syllabus goes through and tells you the topics that we're going to be doing every single week. Um, if you were to think of that as a, particularly the last page of the syllabus, as a very basic guide um, for students, that would be a, a good example that you could sort of grab onto right now. Contrary to that, a guide for the teacher is designed more to help them facilitate the instruction. Um, for those of you that are K-12 teachers, if you think about the difference between a textbook and then the teacher's manual that goes along with it, or some cases uh, historically in particular. There used to be like a teacher's version of the textbook which would have the textbook there but would also on the outside margins um, have all of this additional teacher stuff that was in there. Um, that was in a good example of a teacher guide. What you're looking at there again similar to what you've got in the students it's a way of helping the instructor organize the information because as instructional designers you have to remember that in many instances we're not going to be the ones that are actually doing the training you know we're going to be working with the subject matter experts and the pedagogical experts and in some cases you know the multimedia folks and um, all sorts of other individuals that are going to have you know stakeholders that are going to have input into the training that we're designing but at the end of the day in most instances, the instructional designer is going to hand over the materials and somebody else, again, usually a certified teacher or a certified trainer or a subject matter expert, is going to be the one that actually delivers the content. So this is a way of basically giving them sort of a cheat sheet as to, you know, here's some effective strategies that you could use to present this particular content or based upon our pilot testing, um, here is a list of ways that 
um, or a list of guiding questions that the teacher found very useful when they covered, you know, when they did this discussion in the previous one. These are the kind of things that would normally go into a teacher guide. Um, so again, to, to look at it a little bit different or to look at them side by side, um, the student guide is a way of organizing things for the student to assist in their learning. A teacher guide is a way of organizing things to essentially make them be have a chance to be a more effective teacher because they can sort of see the bigger picture. The next step is to conduct formative revisions. Uh, Stufflebeam, who is a, an, an evaluator essentially, um, once wrote that the purpose of evaluation is to improve rather to rather than prove. And that's really the purpose of this formative revision stage. Um, usually in the next stage we'll talk about in a sec is going to be pilot testing, but the whole point of pilot testing and, and the, 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 the revisions and the evaluation that, sorry, the evaluation and then the revisions that come out of it is not necessarily to test whether or not the students learned it. That's what happens during the implementation and the evaluation stage. During the development stage when you're doing the pilot testing and doing the formative revisions here, the evaluation that you do at this stage is designed to improve upon the materials that you've designed. So if you're doing web-based training, this is where you get someone to come in and, and actually go through it and see if they do it in the sequence that you wanted them to do. See if they click on the things they're supposed to click on. Um, see if they interact with the system the way in which it was intended. And if they don't, to go in and tinker with it to improve upon it. So again, the purpose of this stage or this step I should say is to revise essentially all of the things that you've designed all of the things that you've developed to this date prior to actually implementing it so this is prior to you bringing it into a classroom so this is where you you get a smaller sample of groups that that may be representative of the people who are doing the training or maybe you even get one or two folks who are the target group for the training that are going to do this on a trial basis uh, the two main types of evaluation along the way are formative and summative. <clears throat> uh, formative are the things that you're doing um, while you are essentially pilot testing so that it allows you to revise and, and, and fix things before it actually gets implemented. Summative evaluation is that final step in the ADDI paradigm, that evaluation step. That's your summative evaluation there because that's after the actual training has been implemented, that's when you collect the data to determine whether or not your training was effective with those. So this step we're talking about here in the develop phase, we're talking about the formative evaluation here. It's the summative evaluation that will come later. Now the way in which most people will conduct a formative evaluation is they'll actually pilot test it. Um, pilot testing is essentially bringing it out into the field and getting either the target group, a smaller group, you know, a smaller part of the target group, or someone who resembles the target group to actually conduct or to use the materials in which you've developed. Um, there are a couple of types of, of field trials. Um, one is a non-credit field trial. Um, for those of you familiar with the university environment, this is kind of like auditing a course. You know, you get to sit in, you can do the assignments, you can sit in on the lectures and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, you, you're not assigned a grade, um, so you don't have to, to worry about it. It's for those of you in the K-12 environment, it's like that kid that does the advanced placement course in high school, but doesn't take the advanced placement exam to try to get college credit. They just want the experience of it. They want to see what a college level science class is like. And then when they go off to university, actually take pretty much that same course again at the university. That's kind of like a field trial thing. Um, a pilot test is where you actually bring individuals who are either similar to your sample um, group to actually go in and try this out. So if we were to use the airline firefighters that you're talking about in your practice test, well your practice tests or your practice activities are specifically focused upon firefighters that are based with an airline, which is a little bit different, but fairly similar to your traditional municipal firefighter that, you know, has the firehouse down the street, and if the house next to you 
catches a fire, they're the ones that come and, and put it out. And a good example of a pilot test would be to actually have, you know, one of these municipal firefighters or a couple of these municipal firefighters go through the training in your practice activity because while they're not the target group that you're looking at, they are very similar to that target group. Um, so when you actually conduct the pilot test, regardless if you use the field test, the non-credit field test, or the pilot test itself, essentially what you're looking at doing is you're looking at analyzing the data grouped across the different types of learners you have. Um, you might may want to, uh, to, it's a good idea, sorry, to display this graphically. Um, you want to make sure that the data that you analyze reflects the overall picture of the instruction so you don't want to focus upon individual things um, because let's face it with any workshop with any training program that you're doing with any course you're putting off there's always going to be one little thing that goes wrong and there's always going to be one little thing that really goes right the whole point of a data analysis is to get the big picture you know, if you're looking at sort of, a, you know, this landscape on the wall, you don't want to focus on the one tree. You want to focus upon, you know, the whole forest and the mountains and the sky and everything in the background. Um, the other thing is that the, the analysis of that data should be organized by objective. So that way you can look and see if there are any specific objectives that didn't do well in your pilot testing. Because those are typically ones that if you were to implement it as is, when your actual learners get evaluated in that fifth phase, in that evaluation phase, chances are they will not do well on that objective unless you go back and revise the um, materials for that one. So that's why you want to organize those things by objective. Um, the revisions that you make are going to be based upon on the data you have. Um, the whole point of doing the pilot test is to be able to see what happens, to be able to collect the data that you, you, you can get from various sources that you're going to have here. In some cases it might be from the actual test that they do. Um, you may do, say, focus groups or interviews or have some sort of, of survey that you give the people who do um, your pilot testing. But the decisions you make and the revisions that you make to the material are going to be based upon the things that you observe throughout the process and the data that you collect. Um, you want to make sure that you continue to use strong learning principles. Um, while the data might say that the way in which you chose to do this particular instructional activity wasn't the best, um, you still, when you make those revisions, want to make sure that the changes you make to the instructional strategy for that particular activity are still based upon learning principles or on specific learning theory. Um, one of the things that you will see instructional designers do from time to time is this fourth item here that um, as they go through and they look at the data and, and they make their observations, as the the items are being pilot tested they'll get a gut feeling about something um, you know they'll see that something isn't working the data will tell them that it didn't work and as they're watching it unfold as they're they're seeing it happen as it gets confirmed by the data they'll have a gut feeling about okay this is how it needs to be changed uh, for any of you that have ever taught a course before I, I'm willing to bet that every single one within that list as they're teaching the course, they think to themselves, okay, this is something I do differently next time. That's that fourth item. That's that based on intuition item. So again, as, as sort of a summary, I guess, there are six main procedures to the development uh, phase of the ADI paradigm. And at the end of this, you are going to have a set of learning resources. For the purposes of our course, you're actually going to de to deliver something called a development summary um, because we're not going to be doing all of the things for example with the two guides that are there I don't expect you to develop the complete guides I'm just going to ask you to develop the cable table of contents for those guides um, I'm not going to ask you to actually go back and conduct formative revisions because you'd need to do a pilot test for that but there's a small activity in place of that to outline how you would go about it uh, the same thing with the instructional strategies and the media we're not going to develop the complete stuff both for the practice activity and for the team-based activity um, you're going to do a selection of items
So again, that's the development stage, which is the third of the five stages of the Addy paradigm.